Hello viewers, today we will be doing the lesson Gulliver's Travel by Jonathan Swift who was a very famous writer of the 18th century. This lesson we will divide it into two parts and today we will be doing part one. Before getting into the lesson, let us look the objectives of the lesson. First and foremost is to know the author Jonathan Swift and his contribution to literature. Next, it is to analyze his text Gulliver's Travels. And third, it is to study the various journeys mentioned in the course of his course of the book. Now, let us start with the introduction. Gulliver's Travels was perhaps the most famous of Jonathan Swift. Its title is very long, but today it is popularly known as Gulliver's Travels, a satire on social and political life of his times. The book resulted in a great deal of controversy when it was first published in 1726, but even without the controversial passages, Gulliver's Travels is not only about a specific set of political conflicts, but also a comprehensive portrayal of human condition. We will look now about the author. Jonathan Swift was the son of an English lawyer. He was born in Dublin, Ireland on November 30, 1667. He grew up there in the care of his uncle before attending Trinity College at the age of 14, where he stayed for seven years, graduating in 1688. In that year, he became the secretary of Sir William Temple, who was an English politician and a member of the Whig Party. In 1694, he took religious orders in the Church of Ireland and then spent a year as a country parson. During this time, deeply affected by the political and religious corruption surrounding him, Swift started writing satires on these subjects. He wrote A Tale of the Tub, where he defended the position of the Anglican Church against the criticism leveled at it by the left and the right. He also penned the Battle of the Books, where he averred that the classics were better than the modern literature and thought of his time. In addition, he also penned a number of political pamphlets. He then spent further time in the services of Temple before returning to Ireland to become the chapel of Earl of Berkeley. Meanwhile, he had begun to write satires on the political and religious corruptions surrounding him. Late in life, Swift seemed to become more casuistic and bitter than he had been. Three years before his death, he was declared unable to care for himself and guardians were appointed. Based on these facts and on the comparison between Swift's fate, that of his character Gulliver, some people have concluded that he gradually became insane and that his insanity was a natural outgrowth of his indignation and outrage against human mankind. However, the truth seems to be that Swift was suddenly incaptuated by a paralytic stroke late in life and that prior to this incident his mental capacities were unimpaired. Now coming to the background of the lesson, Gulliver's Travels 
was perhaps the most famous works of Jonathan Swift. Its title is Travels into Several Remote Nations of the World in Four Parts by Lemuel Gulliver. First as a surgeon and then as a captain of several ships. Today it is popularly known as Gulliver's Travels. A satire on social and political life of his time, the book resulted in a great deal of controversy when it was first published in 1726. The book could appear as Swift had originally written only after nearly 10 years from when it first came out. Even then, subsequent editors of the book have deleted many sections especially the more scathing ones dealing with bodily functions. But even without those passages, Gulliver's travel is not only about a specific set of political conflicts, but also a comprehensive portrayal of human conditions. What makes it unforgettable and relevant is its often despairing but occasionally hopeful sketch of the possibilities of humanity to ruin in its baser instincts. The fantastic fairy tale situations have now become a very popular among children's tales. Swift satirizes pompousity, pride and folly of human beings. He parodizes travel literature to fulfill his satirical intents and uses it as a vehicle to express his misanthropoic views. The book is allegorical because each of the voyages reveal Sarkatius who stand for exaggerated forms of human beings depicting some qualities which shift found suitable for critical portrayal. Now we will look into the summary of this novel. Gulliver's Travels narrates the story of its hero, Lemuel Gulliver's travel to imaginary lands. The book consists of four parts, each of which describes Gulliver's adventure in different strange undiscovered lands that are populated by weird and wonderful creatures, very like human beings, yet significantly different. The narrative is in the first person. Gulliver recounts the adventures that befall him on these trivials and in an almost expressionless style. He hardly ever demonstrates any sign of introspection or deep involvement in what he is narrating. The novel is in the past tense. The tone of Gulliver is gullible and naive during the first three voyages, but in the fourth it turns cynical and bitter. The major conflict in this novel is on the surface, Gulliver strives to understand the various societies with which he comes into contact and to have these societies understand his native England. Below this, we find Swift engaged in a conflict with the English society he is satirizing. The rising action of Gulliver's encounter with other societies eventually leading up to his rejection of human society in the fourth voyage. Some of the themes of the novel are might versus right, the individuals versus society, the limits of human understanding and human ambition. 
Many motifs are also used such as excrement, foreign languages, clothing, etc. Some of the popular symbols are the small size of Lilliputans, the huge Borbidings, the eccentric Laputanians, the rational Homoniums and the bestial Yahoos. Gulliver's experiences with various flawed societies foreshadows his ultimate rejection of human society in the fourth voyage. When you look into the morality, Swift also uses his travelogue to comment on morality. The book presents a debate between might versus righteousness. The author questions the efficacy of that power which is not tampered by morality. For instance, Gulliver is able to help the Lilliputans army against their enemies only because of his huge size. He does not waste a moment's contemplation on whether he is justified in supporting the Lilliputans or the defeating the Balbicans navy. Similarly, in Borbidan, his minute size lays him open to repeated dangers where ambiguity about his moral response is often an issue. Swift's satire is powerful in commenting upon the suspicious and aggressive nature of human societies. For instance, when Gulliver awakens in Lilliput, he finds himself imprisoned in chairs. Similarly, in Borbidang, he is captured by a farmer and used by him to earn money. When he finds the Yahoos enslaved by the Homians, he does not think this as wrong. Now looking into the religious aspect, adherence to religious tenets, controversies arising of different interpretations of religion has always been a context of tension in Gulliver's native land. That he is seen navially idealizing his own country in a telling manner in which Swift expresses his skepticism. For instance, the Hoynims justify their superiority because for them order, discipline, cleanliness, rationality are all and inviolable as religion. In this, the Yahoos are far behind and therefore deserve to be looked down upon. The belief of people in the third part of the book smacked of fantasism against a symbol of misguided religious zeal. When you look into the identity, Swift uses his book to comment on the theme of individual identity. At one level, this identity seems essential for the smooth running of social institutions, but it also has the danger of making individuals self-centric with no thought for the evolution of society. Now looking into the alienation, another significant theme is that of alienation. Gulliver symbolizes this concept of alienation right from the beginning. He begins life by failing to make a mark in English society as a surgeon. He is unable to support himself and his family in spite of inheriting his father's estate. Therefore, he becomes a stranger in his own surroundings. The extent of his alienation from England can easily be guarded by observing how reluctant he is to return home after each voyage and how quickly he embarks on the next one to escape from this isolated 
maljudicated existence. Now, in our model 4, we will be doing part 1 of a voyage to Lilliput. The book begins with a short preamble in which Lemuel Gulliver, in the style of books of the time, gives a brief outline of his life and history before his voyages. He enjoys traveling, although it has it is his love of travel that is his downfall during his first voyage gulliver is washed ashore after a shipwreck and finds himself as a prisoner of a race of tiny people less than 6 inches tall who are inhabitants of an island country of lilliput Gulliver's adventure in Lilliput begins when he walks after his shipwreck to find himself bonded by innumerable tiny threads and addressed by tiny captors who are in awe of him but fiercely protective of their kingdom. They are not afraid to use violence against Gulliver though their arrows are tiny are little more than pin pickers to Gulliver but overall they are hospitable. Risking famine in their land by feeding Gulliver who consumes more food than a thousand Lilliputans combined. He is taken to the capital city by a vast wagon specially built by the Lilliputans. He is presented to the emperor who is entertained by Gulliver just as Gulliver is flattered by the attention of royalty. After giving assurances of his good behavior, he is given a residence in Lilliput and became a favorite at the court. From there, the book follows Gulliver's observation on the court of Lilliput. He is also given the permission to roam around the city on conditions that he will not harm their subjects. <music> Gulliver assists the Lilliputans to subdue their neighbors, the Bulfishidians by stealing their fleet. Eventually, Gulliver becomes a national resource used by the army in its war against the people of Balfishian, whom the Lilliputans hate for doctrinal difference concerning the proper way to crack eggs. However, he refuses to reduce the island nation of Balfishians to a province of Lilliput displeasing the king and the court. But things change when Gulliver is convicted of treason for putting out a fire in the royal palace with his urine and is condemned to be shot in the eyes that is blinded and starved to death. Gulliver was convicted for treason for making water in the capital even though he was putting out the fire and saving countless lives, among other crimes. With the assistance of a kind friend, Gulliver escapes to Bulfishian, where he spots and retrieves as an abundant boat and sails out to be rescued by a passing ship, which safely takes him back home to England. In module 6, we will be doing uh, his second voyage that is voyage to Borbidang. 
After staying in England with his family for two months, Gulliver is eager to travel again. So he undertakes his next sea voyage, which takes him to a land of giants called Borbidangs. When the sailing ship Adventure is steered off, of course, by storms and forced to go into the land for want of fresh water, Gulliver is abandoned by his companions and found by a farmer who is 72 feet tall. He brings Gulliver home and his daughter cares for Gulliver. The farmer treats Gulliver as a curiosity and exhibits him for money. The words get out and the queen of Borbidang wants to see the show. She loves Gulliver and he is then brought by her and kept as a favorite at court. Since Gulliver is too small to use their huge chairs, beds, knives and forks, the queen commissions a small house to be built to Gulliver so that he can be carried around in it. This is referred to as his traveling box. Social life is easy for Gulliver after his discovery by the court, but not particularly enjoyable. Gulliver is often repulsed by the physicality of the Borbidangs, whose ordinary flaws are many times exaggerated by their huge size. In between small adventures, such as fighting giant waps and being carried to the roof by a monkey, he discusses the state of Europe with the king. He is generally stalated by the ignorance of the people here. Even the king knows nothing about politics. The king is not happy with Gulliver's account of Europe especially upon learning of the use of guns and cannons. On a trip to the seaside, accompanying the royal couple, his traveling box is seized by a giant eagle which drops Gulliver in his box right into the sea where he is picked up by some sailors who return him to England. This book compares the truly moral man to the representative man. The latter is clearly shown to be the lesser of the two. Swift, being in Anglican holy orders, was likely to make such comparisons. Well, learners, hope you all have enjoyed this novel and see you all in the next class. Thank you.